So tonight's all about transformation. There are many, many different ways of achieving transformation, as we've heard from the wonderful speakers tonight. But it's hard to argue against the truly transformative power of technology. It affects virtually every aspect of our lives. And when we talk about the inventiveness, um, Yankee ingenuity, who more than an icon of that than Thomas Edison? He's known to the world as the Wizard of Menlo Park. That's not that far away from here. But little known to most is he started that inventive career right here in Newark. In fact, his factory was, is just a few blocks from here. It doesn't exist anymore. It's behind the uh, Prudential Center, where his first invention, the, the uh, stock ticker tape, provided him the resources to move out of the city to a larger, more affordable track that was Menlo Park, and the rest is history. But Thomas was really an icon, but in the middle of a great spirit, an ecosystem of inventiveness that existed here in the United States, a lot of it concentrated right here in northern New Jersey. People whose names have ultimately created industries that have lasted for a century. They were scientific entrepreneurs, people who understood how to mine the accumulation of science that had come about in the 1800s and turn them into important and compelling products. But they weren't just lone wolves, because in fact, behind all of that, there was also a fair amount of collaboration and competition that honed their products to be the things that we remember. Edison, we all know, invented the phonograph. But Eldridge Johnson is the one who decided that the platter discs that were created by gramophone were a much better way to go, easier to manufacture and higher quality. And his company, Victrola, ultimately stole the show, and Edison got out of that business. Competition drove the breed. The Hyatt family in Newark really invented modern plastics, the processing of celluloid. Their objective was to find a replacement for ivory and come up with synthetic billiard balls. They never quite achieved that. But their accomplishments and their technologies inspired another inventor to come up with a flexible version of celluloid. His name was George Eastman. He actually started Eastman Kodak here in Newark. And the film that he made empowered Edison to create the motion picture. At the same time, they inspired another chemist named George Bakelin, who invented the first commercial synthetic plastic, also in the pursuit for billiard balls. And while he didn't get billiard balls, he did create the basis of the insulators, the plugs, the sockets, all the things that really made electricity become a household item and also empowered the growth of electronics inside of the automobile and drove the automotive age. And so all of these are folks whose inventions ultimately begat companies and those companies have survived through the decades. But then along the way, of course, we all get a little bit older, and they have to pass the torch. And we saw that those companies began to evolve into a pattern of professional management, but they kept the spirit of inventiveness embodied in corporate research and development. And you see littered here across the decades from the 20s to the 80s, just the, you know, the, the, the top handful of invent inventions they came out of great places like Bell Laboratories here in New Jersey, Ford Motor Research, RCA, General Electric Research and Development Corporation, SO Research, and on and on and on. It's amazing. And it's not just the products they invented, which we might recognize, but there is the innovations, the Im successive improvements of those products that made them more affordable, more useful, and also behind the scenes, the development of the technologies by which they manufactured those items to become more important. Something happened along the way. When we hit the 80s, we began to feel all sorts of business pressures. It's a whole other talk to go into the hows and the whys of what happened, but very clearly the response of American industry to all of these challenges was, in a sense, to turn off that inventive machinery, to downsize, to right-size, to outsource, to take that R&D environment that required the largesse of globally dominant companies and essentially redirect it to deal with the more short-term problems and issues of incremental improvement, and we lost our ability to invent for the future. And now we look and see that at the same time as we've reduced our capacity to deal with change, we're suddenly confronted with an accumulation of new science that really could revolutionize the way in which many of our core industries have done business for the last 100 years. How are we going to respond to that? When I grew up, Darwin's theory was called survival of the fittest. And there's no question that the T-Rex in the Cretaceous period was the fittest. He was the meanest cat in the block. But we now know that this is really more about evolution being survival 
of the most adaptable. And so what happened to the T-Rex when stressed? T-Rex is gone and the mammals survived. So what lesson do we take from that? Are we in fact of need to re recreate exactly the same scenario? Must our large industries disappear and be replaced by new ones? Certainly in the area of Edison, that's what happened. The gaslighting companies couldn't adapt. Maybe that was a bridge too far. But he took over the street lighting from the gas utilities. At the same time, when he became entrenched, he couldn't accept Tesla's alternating current. And he became displaced by the next generation of power generation. Is that a lesson? Well, I'm not sure that we have the time, and the patience, or the necessity to wait for 30 or 40 years for our small startups to suddenly become the next big thing. We need both. We need innovation at the individual company level, but we really need to find a way to support our anchor industries so they can also partake in innovation. So it calls for all of us, perhaps, to rethink our traditional roles and responsibilities. Much of what we think has existed forever really is a product of the post-World War II environment. Certainly, if not that, then back to the early 1900s. The role of government has largely been to regulate industry, to protect us as citizens from the unbridled greed and ravages of powerful industry. And our industries have been designed to, com to compete fiercely with each other, to become the, the big kid on the block, the, the alpha male. And universities, literally by federal policy since World War II, were told that A, educate, and frankly, B, educate. But if you're going to do research, we're going to fund you to develop basic scientific knowledge, be discoverers, and open that up to the world and let them figure out what to do with it. And we're finding that is not a very efficient model, and more to the point, our international competitors have discovered that we really need a much different kind of public-private partnership to move anchor industries ahead. And so, as the Ford commercial says, and is better than or. We, of course, will continue to need regulation to protect us when necessary, but we also need a government that understands how to invest and promote its core businesses. And companies need to understand that there are times when they have to collaborate in order to compete. We no longer have Ma Bell, AT&T, that is the American telecommunications industry. Look at all the pieces that are left after the divestiture. And so you no longer then have the revenue stream that allows you to split off a little piece in the fifth decimal place and support 10,000 of the world's best minds in what was called Bell Laboratories. We need to find a way to be able to pull together to develop the next generation technologies, the platform technologies that move an entire industry ahead and allow each one to use its own cleverness in order to improve that. And universities need to understand that there's more than just the discovery of science. There is a need and an importance for us to understand how to be engaged in the innovation process, how to take ideas and turn them into products and processes, or at least how to understand the problems that world so they better inform the scientific areas that we discover. So let's talk a little bit about what we need to do to get our own house in order, and I hope the other two will come along. As I look around the, uh, the, the world with which we compete, I, I see echoes of a study that was uh, done by Richard Lester at MIT about a decade ago, studying regional economies, and where he discovered that universities are ideal in this arena, not for peddling our intellectual property. As good as it is, it's not big enough to make the dramatic change required, but by the creation of open space, to be a place that convenes industry to come in and solve the problems together. And in that context, an organizational structure, what are called buffer institutions. On the university, but not in the university. Their function is not education. Their function is not basic scientific research. They work on the problems that come to them from industry as opposed to the problems that come from their own intellect and their own vision. And if you look at the sort of services that buffer institutes can provide, you'll see that they are not classic university functions, but they're not functions that anybody else would do either. The soft services of business partnership formation, supply chain identification and education, the evaluation of technologies, setting of standards and training and testing, even more aggressive than that, getting into the world of technology development, platform development, not scientific discovery, but actual inventive process proprietary problem solving, creation of physical prototypes. These are all things which assist not only big companies, but small companies in taking ideas and bringing them into action. But what does that do for the university? Well, there's also a benefit on our side of the street, because now you have opportunities proximate to the campus for faculty members 
to be touching the profession that they teach, to understand how the science and the principles that they're teaching in the classroom are directly relevant to what's happening in the workforce today. You know, that used to happen naturally through consultancies. But that was in an era when big America corporations had the research and development environment that engaged faculty members. So in a sense, by eliminating the R&D, not only did we remove capacity from our large companies, but we also eliminated a very important social network. Long before there was Facebook, there were, in fact, interactions on a personal level that drove this whole ecosystem that we call an innovation ecosystem. So it's an opportunity for our faculty members to be engaged. It's an opportunity for our students to be engaged, both as workers and as observers and learning, understand how to make that intimate connection between fundamentals that should last in their life and applications in the workplace from which they can continue to build and grow. So I can't tell you the whole story. You'll have to tune in. Uh, you know, if you're watching this after the fact on YouTube, you can come back and check the university website. But I will tell you that we are taking this mission on in a big way, and that we are creating a host of buffer institutions, a number of buffer institutions that deal specifically with core industries of New Jersey, which are in fact the core industries of America, like our biopharmaceutical industry, our healthcare industry, the defense and homeland security industry, our financial services industry, wireless, not wireless, but communications and telecommunications industries, and to try to create a little mini Bell Labs environment that supports these in a way that allows each company to prosper and do better, but also creates a greater whole, a body of knowledge that allows the entire sector to move forward. And we think that's an important differentiation between the classic interface between university and industry that very often has what an electrical engineer would call an impedance mismatch. It just doesn't quite work to something in which the buffer institution can smooth out those wrinkles and provide a benefit for all. And if we do our job properly, we may just find that Rexy could survive and coexist and not eat his friends, the humans, and we can all prosper and go forward and see a much brighter tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>